is this thing called love? When you hear that question, who do you imagine asking it? Maybe it's a curious child, eager to wrangle abstract concepts and expand our emotional vocabulary. Or maybe an angsty teenager in the throes of that first relationship and wondering, is this what the writers write about and the singers sing about, or should I save the elder for something more? The grateful murmur of a grinning groom waiting at the altar. The odd whisper of the mother who's just been handed a newborn and knows nothing will ever be the same. The cry of a man who blindsided with divorce papers. Or maybe you don't have to imagine it all. Maybe the puzzle rears its head in your own lives. What is this thing called love? As long as we've drawn breath, humans have been uplifted, enthralled, bewildered, confused, hypnotized, invigorated, and delighted by this question. And I'm here to say that it's inextricably intertwined with another topic that our civilization just cannot get off its mind. The transcendent, the numinous, religion, faith, God. In particular, I want to share tonight how the Christian faith has shaped how I ask and answer what is this thing called love? Christianity has a lot to say in response to that question, and vice versa. The fact that we can't help but ask it has a lot to say about Christianity. Scripture tells us simply and famously that God is love. Combine that with Christ's declaration that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Reach into high school math, pull out the transitive property, and voila! Love is the way, the truth, and the life. Simple out. Uh, okay, maybe it's not quite so simple. Uh, let's look at these three facets in turn. First, the way to Christian love. Second, the truth about that love. And finally, the life that we can live if we claim that love for ourselves and let it claim us. The way, the truth, and the life. Let's go. First is the way. We who walk in the West today are pretty darn sure that we've got the way, and that way is the Enlightenment. Locke, Voltaire, Newton, Hume, this revolutionary tradition that reifies reason and so skepticism and humbles the human mind by forcing us to face our own fallibility. We're steeped in it. And as a result, we never take surety for granted. That's an incredible achievement if you think about how often our predecessors clung fiercely to certainties that they hadn't even begun to earn. Not us. We question, we quiz, we probe and ponder, debate and doubt, do we doubt? But we're petrified of turning all that exploration into claims of belief. Dogmas, superstitions, certainty itself, all unsophisticated training wheels we've happily outgrown. Or have we? Have you? How satisfied are you personally with your understanding of the universe? Deeply? Transcendently? I wasn't. My whole life I harbored deep curiosity, a voracious hunger to ask as many questions as I could before, well, before adults got such of answering them. Um, but what once seemed like endlessly promising avenues of intellectual inquiry were starting to feel more like circular cul-de-sacs, if not outright dead ends. I'd always thought, if I can just take all the philosophy classes I need, I can put the nagging questions to rest. And those occasional pangs of loneliness that we all get now and then, they'd be banished forever, I felt sure. If I could just surround myself with all the right friends, an ideal girlfriend. How dismaying, then, when the only thing studying moral philosophy really convinced me was that objective logic alone can't ever lead us to the ethical principles that we all know are right. How unsettling. The realization that other people, no matter how much you love them, can't always quash that sense of solitude that stubbornly sets up shop in the pit of your stomach. So the way of serious rationalism was getting me mostly nowhere. I felt like the character G.K. Chesterton called the morbid logician, a guy who trying to make everything lucid just ends up making everything mysterious. But I couldn't shake the sense that it would be unjustifiable, immoral almost, to hope for anything I couldn't see with my own eyes, to trust in something I couldn't conclusively prove, even if delusion is bliss, I thought. I'm above all that. Sound familiar? But there's a problem with this 
attitude. There's a big problem. It turns on the assumption that something is real if it maps neatly onto our intellectual schemas and isn't if it doesn't. That enlightenment skepticism that comes so naturally to us, it puts our own minds on quite the pedestal. Babies think that their parents stop existing whenever they're out of sight, and we know that that's crazy, but that's exactly how we treat ideas. Whenever we encounter something for which a completely rational and exhaustive story eludes our grasp, instead of doubting the limits of our logic, we assume away the thing itself. And we have the goal to call this epistemological modesty. Modesty, that's arrogance, right? If it doesn't make total sense to me, it mustn't exist. We constantly brush aside Christianity with that premise, even if we don't say so. But a child could use the same thin reasoning to claim that the particle physics is wrong simply because he doesn't get it yet. <laughs> Humans crave transcendental things, things which, by definition, we can't fully wrap our minds around. But then we dismiss them because we can't completely intellectualize them. We're so quick to question the concepts, God or love, but very slow to question our own skeptical approach. But for a long time, folks sought and found enduring love in oceans of received wisdom and ritual far deeper than anything they could accumulate themselves. We double down on psychotherapy, Prozac, and the crazy notion that it's somehow cheating if we don't reinvent the wheel ourselves. <coughs> but that is never how love works. What if we refuse to trust our parents until we could elaborate why they care for us? Or refuse to steal that first kiss until we analyze the biochemistry of attraction? <laughs> In all the corners of life that really means something, love precedes logic. Profound fulfillment, soaring security, these things lead the charge bursting into our spirits, bearing torches of brilliant light and warmth. Ex post facto rationalizations, they follow sheepishly behind. So, skeptics, don't insist on putting the cart before the horse when it comes to God. That's not the way you look for love anywhere else. That firm conviction that fulfillment could never flow from externally unverifiable faith, well, that's an externally unverifiable faith. Try bringing skepticism to your skepticism. That's humility. That's real questioning. And that's the way to him who is the source of the unfathomable love for which we cannot help but yearn. This way is the way to truths that you feel in your bones, to epiphanies that make your soul whisper excitedly to your conscious mind, hey, yeah, you're onto something here. It's the way of meditation, of reflection, of prayer before you're positive that someone's listening. It's not the way that self-obsessed solipsism could ever illuminate. Second, the truth. Let's look hard at another feature of modern life. This one might make for an easier target around these parts. We are so enthralled by instantaneity. Google answers questions before we finish typing them. Amazon ships in two days, but we still check the tracking nonstop. <coughs> a recent Pew report predicted that my generation, millennials, we thirst for instant gratification. Um, and the article went on, I stopped skimming because I lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> this tendency, I think, imperils our ability to build a meaningful relationship with the God who, in the words of one New Zealand prayer book, reigns in the glory of the power that is love. That's because any love worthy of the name is inescapably gradual. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Pick a favorite moment from one of your loveliest relationships. Could be early memories of parents, a movie night three days into that key relationship, the very first time you met your spouse. Remember how you felt about that person way back when. Now fast forward. How much your love must have grown and changed and deepened and broadened between then and now, or when you parted ways. A young couple will live a vastly different love than the profoundly stable communion that they describe if we check back on their great-grandparents. And I appreciate my family much more today than I could have ever imagined when I was two or five or even twelve. But, and here's the key, it was still always love, wasn't it? The late philosopher Ronald Dworkin had this idea that he called the concept-conception distinction. 
I know that it sounds really scary, but all it really says is that gradual shifts in how we understand or how we live a big idea, those shifts don't imply unfaithfulness to the underlying notion. It sounds commonsensical, but believers, think how often we take the stressful introspection that comes with romance, do I really love him, does she really love me, and apply it to faith. Do I believe in God enough? to call myself a Christian? Is this what loving Christ feels like? Am I failing? Am I tricking myself? Every person of faith I've spoken with during my journey sometimes stresses out like this. To some degree, it's part and parcel of a healthy faith. With careful effort and by the grace of God, our truth about loving Christ in six months, or six years, or six decades may well dwarf our present conception of what it means to walk with our Father. In fact, we can be hope it does. But that shouldn't lead us to the little where we stand today. Loving with one's whole heart means something radically different to a four-year-old boy than to a 40-year-old husband. But that doesn't make the concept any less true at each point along the path. Reflection is key, but constantly, self-consciously checking and measuring our faith can become a false idol all its own. The spiritual life should be a jaw through stunning scenery. Not an anxious time trial spent staring at our watches. Have faith that in the fullness of time, each of our own hearts is the only standard by which the truth of our love shall be weighed. And this brings us to our third and final stop, the life, the life in and of love. So far, we've put aside hyper-skepticism and we've stopped feeling guilty for graduality. Okay, but what's so special about Christianity? Well, if you are simply looking to follow rigorous rules, practice spiritual discipline, and hear that a nirvana of ultimate and amazing love awaits those who have what it takes to make it to the finish line, then the answer may be not much. The world knows no shortage of amazing creeds in that vein. But that isn't how love works either. It's never about getting all your ducks in a row before you feel its warm embrace. If each of us waited until we were optimally successful, perfectly prosperous, physically fit, before we marched on over and asked for that phone number, we would be one lonely species. <laughs> love, love can't be thought a destination, some ultimate reward for a life obediently lived. No, it's the reason we journey in the first place. The gas in our tanks, the map in our hands, the road beneath our wheels, and the drive to keep going, all wrapped into one. As a wise man once told me over tea at Tunnel City, letting God speak to you is less like climbing a ladder and much more like organically coming to trust in a friend. This is the beauty of the Christian story. For as the poet John Donne wrote, "'Twas much that man was made like God before, but that God should be made like man much more." Through Jesus Christ, we can study, yes, mimic, sure, but most amazingly, grow to personally interact with God's love, for there it was and is given a human face. We call Christ Emmanuel, means God with us, not a distant nirvana to calibrate our compasses, but a loving relationship in which to root our lives here and now. What is this thing called? The mystery tells us much about Christianity, and Christianity about the mystery. But that phrase means something else, too. It also happens to be the title of a show to a jazz standard composed by a legendary Cole Porter. It's a charming song, and it suits our purposes here, not in name only. See, the song has this curious feature in its harmony. Andy Jaffe, over in the music building, he calls this modal interchange, but it really just boils down to a fake out. Porter lures the listener into thinking the piece is resolving to a looming minor key, but unexpectedly lurches at the last second into a major tonality, bright and cheerful. That sounds a lot like a lot of folks' faith journeys, mine included. So in closing, I humbly suggest have the courage and the real modesty to invite a relationship with God before you can fully rationalize it. And then have the faith not to get frustrated when you find out that that world is never ending. 
you might just find yourself playing in a brighter key than you ever expected.